Thank you very much. I thought I'd start with this image just to let you know where Darwin is, just in case you didn't know. So very close to Indonesia and Timor-Leste, about 800 kilometres from here to Indonesia as opposed to the 4,000 kilometres I had to travel to come down to remote regional Melbourne. Um, <laughs> so bordering onto a country of 270 million people, so tremendous opportunities to work in the geospatial space where I've been working for the last 15 years. Um, I've changed the title of my presentation slightly, so really focused on um, using technology to promote um, the decentralisation of the use of uh, satellite data. So I'm a raster man, focused on the use of uh, satellite based uh, technologies and there's incredible new opportunities I'm going to talk about today. So. <clears throat> There's been a process of decentralisation of uh, government uh, uh, planning powers and budgeting skills across most of uh, the developing world throughout Southeast Asia and Africa. But there's been generally a lack of uh, commensurate skill development. Um, we still get expert, uh, so I guess I call them like the techno elite, uh, sort of geospatial experts coming in and conducting these uh, satellite-based image analysis and hydrological and terrain analysis. And the number, I've, number of times I've seen analysis being conducted by the external experts, which are just totally wrong, because they don't have the understanding of the local context of where they're working. I mean, I always argue that uh, in order to understand the local environment, you need to work with the people who have uh, several PhDs worth of equivalent uh, local information, and uh, they're the people who live in the local village. So being able to access and work with local knowledge for me is incredibly important. Um, <clears throat> so building, so my focus of my work has been really around building capacity for more accurate and locally supported data. And there's uh, incredible opportunities um, uh, developing through the use of free open source uh, raster data analysis tools, which we've all been talking about today, um, to empower these sort of locally informed or decentralised evidence-based planning. So we've got uh, a revolution in the availability and accessibility of data, so particularly with the launch of the uh, Sentinel-2 satellites um, and with the availability of global elevation data sets. Um, it's allowed an incredible range of uh, uh, satellite-based processing and of course we've got uh, great free open source software. One of the missing links that I've found is training, so providing good quality open source geospatial training software. Um, so it's really been the focus of my work in eastern Indonesia of both cre uh, running workshops but creating comprehensive bilingual training material. So there's a lot of talk about coding, but we also need to provide the resources to actually build capacity in local government and local NGOs. The other revolution I've seen in remote sensing is the accessibility of these data sets. So when I started working in the remote sensing field um, 25 years ago, I was still getting those big sort of uh, tapes that we'd have to sort of plug into the big machines and take an hour to download the imagery. Now we've got these incredible sites, uh, Glovis Next, to the remote pixel sites, and um, recently launched ESIS Sentinel Hub, which um, has really revolutionised the access to um, some of these uh, incredible data sets. So, for example, looking at uh, the ESA um, Earth Explorer Hub, being able to access in near real time um, every five days this 10 metre resolution um, Sentinel-2 data is opening up new opportunities for everyone to essentially be sort of that spy in the sky. So even, even local governments in remote regional parts of the developing world can access this data and be monitoring what's going on in their local environment. Um, and here's an example of another portal being able to access and download uh, elevation data sets. Now there's multiple access points for this now. but. Um, being able to download this and quickly conduct um, some very sophisticated terrain hydrological modelling um, uh, processes is available to everybody. So in this particular case, you've got a globe, you spin around, you click on a tile and you can grab the GeoTIFF, pull it into your favourite open source software and start your analysis. It's just too easy. The piece of software that uh, I focus on using primarily is uh, Saga GIS. I mean, I know um, 
there's a lot of attention at the moment on the use of QGIS. I really gav gravitated towards Saga because of my interest in uh, raster-based analysis functionality. Um, and it's a really very powerful piece of software. It's also portable software, which is nice. A big barrier when you're trying to start any sort of work is being able to install the software in the first place. Saga, um, you can run straight off a USB drive. Um, very sophisticated uh, satellite image analysis um, and terrain and uh, hydrological and terrain modelling functionality. Um, developed by some uh, guys at University of Hamburg. Um, they were really interested in taking the latest uh, published algorithms for terrain and morphometric analysis and putting them into a format that anyone could access. So currently has over 700 you know, cutting edge geoscientific analysis modules and of course, like all great uh, open source software, constantly being updated. So we've got new data sources, we've got uh, new access portals, and we've got great software. So as I've said before, opening up incredible opportunities. So I'm going to talk quickly about a couple of applications, areas I've been working in in eastern Indonesia. So looking at monitoring mining activities and also developing skills for looking at uh, access to health services. So just an example of the sort of revolutionary data sets we're get, getting, here's a large gold mine in uh, Sumbawa in eastern Indonesia. So if we zoom in, that's some Landsat scale imagery, 30 metre pixels. This is what we've got now every five days, which is the Sentinel-2 data sets, um, and incredibly easy to access. We can zoom in once again, that's just sort of a comparison between the resolution of the two, two data sets. And here's an example of um, how it can be used. This is a medium scale mine in the mountains of West Timor, a small manganese mine. Um, local government really doesn't have a lot of capacity, a lot of power or a lot of money. Um, the mine had closed the gate and told them that their mining operation was over, was closed. They were able to access some Sentinel-2 uh, imagery and look at changes over time since they said it was closed and they could zoom in and see there was actually sort of changes in a sedimentation pond and a new road had put in. So although the company wasn't going to let them in, they weren't powerful enough to actually um, uh, ask the company to open the gates, they were able to get this uh, data and actually go to the company and say, what's actually going on? You're violating your terms and conditions of your mining licence. Here's another example. Um, this is actually using Landsat data. I mean, Landsat data is still very important because they're historic archives. So we're looking at a uh, small scale community mining area in southeast Sulawesi. Um, so from 96 to 2015, we can see where there's been um, intensive mining in that area. And then a young fellow who I um, worked with and provided training to from a local NGO, he conducted some analysis where he initially created a uh, land cover map using an object-based segmentation approach in Saga. You can see the mine areas are in red. We've got rice fields in green, and we've got some uh, aquacultural areas um, in the mangroves right down the bottom of that mining area. He then pulled in some free elevation data, and he was able to do a sediment flow analysis. It's not a highly accurate sediment flow analysis, but it gives him a pretty good idea of what's going on in that system. So now we can start ask, asking questions. Is he getting toxic mercury flow used, mercury is used in the gold mining process going into those uh, the fish ponds and into the mangroves in that area? So it gives them a start to sort of discuss what's going on in a very simple, quick analysis using free data conducted locally. So another area I've worked in quite a lot in eastern Indonesia is access to health services. A lot of issues around um, uh, maternal deaths, so women dying during childbirth, so the World Health Organisation um, suggests you need to be within two hours from an uh, a emergency obstetric care during um, childbirth. So it's a major concern, particularly in some of these uh, underdeveloped areas of eastern Indonesia. So using um, standard uh, cost distance analysis RASTA um, tools, we're able to conduct these um, maps of cost distance and we can see in this case this is central Flores there's these areas in red which are more than two hours from um, um, health care. But uh, the problem with these sort of maps is um, access to health care is actually a really complex sort of social cultural story it's not just just a map so we need to be able to incorporate that local knowledge about what are the inhibitors to people um, access, accessing health care beyond just the um, travel time story. 
But at the moment, um, there is a lack of use of these sort of more sophisticated modelling tools amongst people who have that local knowledge. So I spent a bit of time to try and create a more uh, flexible um, modelling tools um, within Saga to open up the application of um, enable wider participation. So we can, as I said, in incorporate some of the environmental and complex social considerations. So within Saga, um, I developed a, uh, it's called a tool chain, incorporating a number of tools together to simplify the process of doing this sort of cost distance analysis, which is now incorporated into the core build. This was a map then produced by a colleague of mine, a young fellow who works in the uh, local health department in the mountains of West Timor. And he was able to take this map and show these areas where there was um, low levels of access to emergency health care. So the idea was um, to develop these tools for the local health department. And this was then, this tool, sorry, the maps that was produced then led to the funding of a new hospital. He took that map um, to Jakarta. They were saying, well, who produced this map? And he said, well, I did. They didn't believe him at first, but they, he was able to use that evidence to help in the advocacy of that new hospital. So a really satisfying outcome for that uh, capacity building work. As I mentioned, I think really the key gap in a lot of this stuff is really clear and locally relevant um, training material. So as I said, I spend a lot of time over the last five or six years working with colleagues in Indonesia, creating hard copy online and video based training material in English and Indonesian using locally based data sets. I mean, you, you can't teach somebody in Eastern Indonesia um, get them engaged in this sort of training unless you're using uh, issues which are close to home, which mean something for them. So using local data and local context is really important. So if you want to have a look, these are the websites. We have uh, Saga tutorials at WordPress and in, in, in Indonesian, um, Saga GIS Indonesia. So the fellows who developed Saga, um, Olaf, Conrad, Victor in Germany, I mean, they love to code, lovely guys, but uh, the training material to date for Saga has been um, pretty absent. So I'm really sort of fill it, filling a niche there. So it's now become, I guess, the, the most common resource for Saga training. Now working with a couple of universities in uh, Mexico to uh, uh, develop a Latin American version of this sort of training material as well. I just think it's a real pity when we've got all this amazing data sets out there that we don't build that capacity amongst people who have the local knowledge to understand what are the key development issues that they need to address with these sort of, these sort of amazing data sets that we have. So supporting the development of the use of uh, these raster data sets, it builds legitimacy in the work they're doing and the outputs through the participation in that work. It supports equity and competence and accountability so when people come from outside and say, okay, this is the analysis they've done, if they have a bit of sort of uh, spatial data literacy, they can question and argue and criticise, I guess, what they've been shown. Um, importantly, I guess this is down the bottom is a sort of standard uh, uh, graphic of um, participation in GIS. And I think through building this capacity, we're sort of heading towards this sort of end goal of trying to empower lo local people, not just involve, but empower through building those skills. And of course, as we develop this training material, um, developing free open source training material for free open source software, it's building a global resource of training material that anyone can access. So personally, I found it a very satisfying journey. And of course, it uh, further legitimizes the use of free open source tools. I mean, I'm off often arguing with our colleagues in uh, Indonesia just to try and say, you know, many of these open source tools, whether it be Saga or QGIS, are often better than some of the Esri products that you might be using. So there's no, no real arguments not to be using them. Um, so a couple of papers I've written to sort of have a bit of evidence backing for my argument, which is basically that all development programs working um, to support um, community and rural development which have a mapping component should support the development of free open source training material and be sh should also be supporting the development of capacity of local people in those environments whilst uh, running those programs. So that's my end statement. Thank you very much.
have time for questions. Anybody have a question for Roman? I have a question. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that uh, there was a disbelief that uh, somebody in Indonesia would be able to do an analysis that's obviously world world scale. Yep. Uh, do you think that that is an ongoing issue, or is it becoming yeah. more reasonable for people to do this sort of thing? Well, it's absolutely reasonable. Anyone can do this sort of work. I mean, it's not rocket science. We're using imagery from rocket science. But um, I think um, often, I, I like that term, the techno elite. So the techno elite in Jakarta, they think they have the sort of magic skills of geospatial analysis. And how could anyone be in sort of a very sort of rote rural region being do, be doing this sort of work? So. Um, I think it was a level of arrogance, I guess, that sort of promoted that disbelief, but um, which isn't commensurate with the level of possibility for developing those skills or decentralising those skills. Any other questions? I think it's also that data sets traditionally been very tightly held. Mm -hmm. So how the hell did you get this information? Yeah. 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 Just going to ask about internet access in the hardware. Yeah. Yeah. So internet access is a big issue, and that's why I sort of generally stray away for uh, web web-based um, solutions in Indonesia. But particularly, for example, that uh, ESA um, Sentinel Hub, being able to choose a small area and only the bands you need to download. So, and even if you need to download overnight, um, yeah, definitely the internet is not worldwide at the moment, um, and there are big, big gaps. So, some of these newer portals really do um, allow you to do, I guess, uh, lower uh, level downloads, but still enable you to access that data. So, yeah, it's a pretty exciting opportunities. So.